I think there, this is something for APIs and I think for all of us to keep in mind as we are now going into month seven, month eight of this pandemic, which is that the virus itself has not changed. It may be that we're experiencing quarantine fatigue, which is very real. It may be that restrictions are being loosened all across the US, but the virus is just as contagious, just as deadly as it was before. And we're now seeing the data that it's not even so much in these formal settings that people are getting infected. At the beginning of the pandemic, it was these congregate settings and people have focused on how can we reduce infection rates, for example, in schools, in nursing homes, in these congregate settings. That remains very important. But I think where we are letting our guard down is with informal settings, gatherings with family, friends, our loved ones. Now, none of us want to think that our loved ones could be carrying coronavirus. And I know that no one would want to knowingly infect anyone else. But let's keep in mind that it's these informal settings that are now driving the pandemic. And so I would urge everyone to use an abundance of caution when we are interacting with loved ones too. The people who do not live in the same household as you, if you are gathering with them. I did want to ground us a little bit with some data on Asian American Pacific Islanders. Uh, it's not necessarily something that everyone's all up to date on. Uh, I would say that uh, early on in the pandemic, uh, it was reported that Asian American Pacific Islanders do not have COVID disparities. Uh, and that is what I think was distorted by the data problem with AAPI health, uh, which generally is either not collected at all, or they lump Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders together, or uh, and certainly there's very little data disaggregated by national origin groups like Chinese or Vietnamese or Filipino or by language. So that's just a general problem for API health. Uh, it wasn't about until two months of the epidemic when uh, uh, some researchers in San Francisco noted that half the deaths in San Francisco from COVID were Asian Americans. And that led to additional research that showed that the proportion of deaths to cases, which is sort of an indication of how, e how severe uh, the, the, the disease might be among Asian Americans was about two to three times higher than that of the overall population. And this was actually found in places uh, in like San Francisco, Los Angeles, Chicago, New York City, New Jersey, Nevada, Massachusetts, uh, and a couple other states. Uh, and, and one potential explanation for this finding was that maybe Asian Americans weren't getting tested adequately in, in adequate numbers. Uh, or that they were getting uh, poorer care, which led to higher deaths. Um, there's also been some data more recently, uh, both from survey data and also from the Kaiser Family Foundation, which looked at testing rates among about 50 million patients who are on the EPIC electronic health record, showing that Asian Americans were less likely to be tested for COVID than whites. Um, and then when they were tested in this particular sample, uh, they were about twice as likely to have a positive test compared to whites. Uh, for Pacific Islanders uh, in California, which is where really the, the best data are coming from, uh, they actually have the second or the highest or the second highest COVID-19 incidence rates uh, of any racial and ethnic group in nearly every county that report uh, NHPI data. Um, and so obviously we do not want to combine Asian American and Pacific Islander data uh, for this uh, one. This is one of the reasons why we don't want to do that. Uh, as far as deaths from COVID is concerned, a, a recent report from the APM Research Labs found that the death rates for Pacific Islanders nationally was about 71 deaths per 100,000, which is only lower than, uh, is lower only among Black and Indigenous Americans. And age-adjusted uh, data on this show that Pacific Islanders are about 2.9 times more likely to die from COVID than white Americans. Uh, and the same report found that Asian Americans were 1.3 times more likely to die from COVID than white Americans. Uh, and then I'll, I'll finish with the, the excess death rate, which is uh, uh, we compare the death rate from this year to prior years. Uh, the national excess death rate among Asian Americans in 2020 is 35% is over prior years, uh, compared to only 9% for white Americans. Uh, in some of the states that we're focused on some, uh, these days, uh, in Florida, that, that excess death rate for Asian Americans is 34%, uh, in Texas, 31%, and in Georgia, 36%. In Pennsylvania, it's 51%, and uh, in New York and New Jersey, over 100%. So just to summarize, uh, uh, AAPIs uh, have risk of exposure to COVID because they are overrepresented among uh, healthcare workers and essential workers. They may not be getting tested for COVID adequately, and they die more from COVID than whites do possibly because of higher comorbidities, poverty, or poor access to quality health care. Thank you. Uh, yes, we are seeing 
folks that have COVID symptoms. I was in our COVID clinic yesterday, but simultaneously, the mental health burden is growing. Uh, and I think that there, this undercurrent of isolation and loneliness is exacerbated, uh, is magnified uh, in communities of color, uh, in families that speak a second language or don't speak English as a primary language. Um, and I think we got to pay attention to that. Uh, and I think it, it just, I think, underscores the importance of hammering yeah. home the need for a vaccine uh, and hammering home the need to take this pandemic seriously, because the faster we get out of this, uh, the yeah. faster we're able to deal with the mental health issue. I think one of the realities uh, that we definitely have to focus in on is that API workers uh, have a high percentage of being essential workers. Most people think of essential workers during this pandemic as healthcare workers, but there are so many industries where API workers uh, work in that expose them more to the COVID and also a lack of information that may be uh, not being given to them by their employers. And I think, um, you know, just speaking on, on that for a moment, this is such a difficult topic because on the one hand, we know that in-person schooling is critical, that we are widening our educational disparities many fold. We're not taking into account food and mental health reasons and so many reasons why students need to be there for in-person instruction. And um, there is a real need for us to focus on those who are the most vulnerable and to get people back. But on the other hand, um, you know, I also come, come to this as the daughter of a school teacher. My, my mother was a longtime school teacher in Los Angeles who had breast mm. cancer. She died from breast cancer, but um, she was undergoing chemotherapy for eight years and radiation for eight years while being a school teacher um, in, in LA. And I think about all the teachers who want to be back, but who need to have protection for their health um, as well. Um, and I think that at the end of the day, this is not something that can exist in a vacuum. We can't look at schools as, oh, let's get people back in schools without thinking about what's happening in the communities around us. If there is widespread community surge, we can't keep schools safe. And so ultimately, we as a society have to decide what are those things that are the most important. If schools are the most important, then we have to be making trade-offs in other ways and saying, what are those other places that are less essential? Right. That, um, that, that, that we may want to close in the meantime. But we totally ignored the fact that this virus is basically a virus of breathing and talking of not just six feet proximity, but any proximity indoors if you don't have ventilation. And, you know, in terms of, the, from my API perspective is, the Japanese actually knew about this and took aerosol airborne precautions from the very beginning. They assumed this virus is airborne from the beginning. And hence they focused on masking, obviously, but also ventilation, also, you know, uh, air, air filtration and completely redoing the subways where also no one talks during subways and keep all windows down on subways. Like all these things where, had we just learned a little bit more from the Japanese and did more uh, just like the testing that the South Koreans did and heeded the warnings coming from China that this was very real. And, you know, even Trump, uh, according to Woodward's tape, uh, clearly recognized, oh, Bob, this is airborne. It's you breathe and you get it. Um, and he was advised based on, you know, his, his contacts in China. And had we just listened to the early science and look at how did the successful countries, you know, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan uh, successfully uh, stop it, we could have avoided so much casualty and infection and grief in this. And so I think, you know, that's where the frustration is. We, we're six, seven months behind the rest of Asia in realizing that this virus is airborne. The PPE is just extremely frustrating. We should have, could have, would have had way more protection for our uh, if only we in induced DPA, the Defense Production Act, and the fact that we failed to do or order any PPEs until mid-March is an epic failure on the U.S. part because our strategic reserve or quickly ran out within a few weeks. Uh, but PPEs right now, we, we're like six months after March, and we are still, still suffering shortages of M95 uh, PPEs, respirators. And right now, a lot of hospitals are now resorting to KN95. But the problem is, uh, according to the latest study, um, 
70, 60, 70 percent of KN95s imported from China are actually are not at filtration grade of a KN95. I think one of the key problem here is that uh, we're not able to reach, we don't have the resources or able to reach out to our communities the way we should with all of these messaging, right? So whether it's um, masking or testing or vaccinations, uh, we have not invested enough in, uh, in, in language or culturally appropriate uh, outreach uh, on all of these. Uh, so what we have now with our population is a group that's actually uh, just basically hold up in their house. We, we do we hear anecdotal evidence of people not leaving their home, so they don't get health care for anything else. Uh, they're very reluctant to do that. They're afraid of um, uh, obviously anti-Asian stigma from and, and, and racial bias uh, from, from the way that things are going in the public uh, domain right now. Uh, and then so, so even when we were to come up with really great ways of solving some of these problems, which we hope mm -hmm. we will have in the next year or two, uh, our communities are still going to be behind on this uh, because we're not investing in it. The, the second thing here is that when you invest in communities of color, uh, you can get the outcomes that are desired. And so the example I would give is that recently uh, we have invested heavily at our nonprofit health center in drive-through uh, flu vaccines. And I think there was this question, okay, um, will, and our, our population is uh, largely Spanish speaking, will a largely Spanish speaking population that perhaps has a historical distrust of some of the medical services here in the Austin area uh, come out for this kind of massive campaign? And the answer is every single day, all 35 slots of our drive-through vaccine clinic uh, are filled every day. Uh, and we've been doing this now for two and a half weeks straight. And so you know, to me, the lesson learned there is you know, let's not make the assumption that our communities aren't going to show up. You know, the answer is, uh, and I think to the point that was made, is that we've got to invest in culturally competent outreach strategies, because if we do so, our communities will show up uh, for appropriate care and treatment and services. Um, but we've got to make the investment. Uh, and I think that's, that's, that's what I'm seeing here on the ground. I mean, obviously I'm biased, right? I, I just uh, finished running an 18 month race for the US Congress. And so uh, the, the, what drove me into that race was this idea that for those of us here in medicine, we take an oath to do no harm. Uh, and when we look at the slate of policies uh, or changes to policy that are being proposed uh, by folks in power right now in Washington, those policies directly harm the communities and patients that we serve. And so then, therefore, we have an obligation to speak out. Being political in and of itself is not a negative thing. Being partisan is, and there is a distinction there. Being political means fighting for uh, the rights and fighting for the empowerment of the communities we serve. That's a part of the democratic process. That's what our country is founded on. Uh, but it's different than being partisan. And so I think we have this, op this obligation and responsibility. When I'm in clinic and I'm seeing patients of mine that live in a certain zip code, and I know that if they go across the highway to a different zip code, their life expectancy likely increases by 10 years. When I was in training, uh, I worked at a clinic where if you were a black man, you had a 30 year life expectancy difference. And if you were a white man, a few miles up the road, zip code shouldn't affect the life expectancy of the patients that we serve. Therefore, it's an obligation to get involved in the policy decisions and in the political process because it directly affects the health and well being of the communities we serve. By definition, public health is by, defined by health policy and health policy is politics. You can't, you know, as much as we want to separate them as, you know, science completely separate of policy, you can't because uh, the, in, the very nature of health policy is political. So I think as, as scientists, as Asian doctors, oftentimes, um, you know, we're often told to, stay in our lane, right? Just see patients, you know, don't, don't go beyond um, what your day job is, uh, seeing patients or doing your research. And I think this, this also gets at the glass ceiling uh, issue. I think we have to be outspoken and we have to advocate and advocate more than just the whimper as many healthcare workers uh, have the capacity to. We actually have to lean into the policies and the politics of this because holding political leaders accountable so that they don't dilute 
muzzle, censor science, public health science actually saves lives. It's so critical for us healthcare workers. It's a huge risk. Uh, one week after the general uh, election, the Supreme Court will start to hear arguments uh, on this ACA case. Uh, 20 million Americans uh, could lose their health insurance. Uh, the stakes could not be higher. And I don't mean, this is not hyperbole here. I mean, the reality is I, I practice medicine in a state that has the highest number of uninsured individuals in the nation, state of Texas. Uh, on top of that, uh, the ACA has been under attack for the last decade, uh, and now the Supreme Court will start to hear these cases. Uh, if this ends up in a 4-4 four -four tie, uh, or if there's a new justice on the court by then, uh, this will have ra ramifications throughout. And so I, I, I think that, you know, to the second part of this uh, question, how can people take action? Uh, look, I, I'm not going to tell you how to vote uh, or, or what to support, but I'll tell you that if you care about uh, health insurance and you care about the uninsured and the underinsured in our country, uh, then you ought to be active on phone banks uh, and on registering people to vote. Now's the time. One last point I'll make here is about the importance of trusting science. I know so many other people touched upon this too, but I think there has been um, something that I have, I did not think that I would see in my career, which is that the CDC, the FDA, these trusted scientific institutions, their credibility is now um, under attack, not because of the work that they're doing. There are exceptional scientists working there, but because unfortunately their work has gotten politicized. And I think that's why we as physicians, as public health leaders, um, we need to be doing our part and as community members as well, to be doing our part to really emphasize the importance of science in driving this response. Well, I want for politics to be removed from this entire conversation. I actually think it's not helpful when politicians, for example, are speculating on when a vaccine um, is going to be coming out because there are people who will look at that and think that the entire process of vaccine approval is getting politicized. Um, I think it's a major problem that something as basic as mask wearing has become a partisan symbol as opposed to a public health imperative. That's my view. Now, I, I think there are, is a need for, I know others can talk about this, for, um, for physicians to be involved in politics and advocacy. But for me as a physician, I think my voice and my role is on educating the public in a nonpartisan way. Well, there's only one person with a health care plan for America. The other person doesn't actually have a plan. We keep getting promises that things will get better, but that's not a plan. Uh, uh, one of the candidates, uh, the Democratic candidate, has laid out a very comprehensive health care plan. Um, and so uh, you, know, you can look at it and criticize it, but I think uh, the other candidate basically wants to take away uh, the Affordable Care Act, uh, does not want to coordinate any national effort, in, in producing PPEs and in, in sort of uh, encouraging people to wear masks. Yeah, so I, I just feel like it's, uh, it's pretty much, a, you know, it's, it's hard to criticize a plan that doesn't exist. Yeah, I think uh, Joe Biden's plan for universal masking is really, really critical because, you know, until we have a vaccine and widely distributed and adopted, we need to mask and we cannot avoid masking for a long, long time. And especially as we enter the winter, especially as Florida, Ron DeSantis is actually reopening restaurants and bars and nullifying all mask mandates so that they cannot be enforced. This is just gonna put us in a terrible, terrible path towards a brush fire that will burn out of control, akin to what's happening on the West Coast, but for COVID in many of these anti-mask states that you know run not just Florida, but also Georgia, so Nebraska, these, and I think you need federal leadership on this point. And Joe Biden's plan for national mask mandates and funding to support schools in this area is so critical. Only one thing, which is that it is so critical for all of our candidates to be standing behind our scientists instead of pushing them under the bus. Um, this is a time when we need for public health to be leading. Um, and I mean, this is a public health crisis. We need public health to be at the forefront and science and data and trust in public health should not be undermined. And so I would look to any of our candidates, again, speaking in a nonpartisan manner um, for me, but um, I would look to all of our candidates to see who is going to put public health front and center and support science rather than undermine it. Look, I have got my scrubs on. I'm about to head over uh, to... Uh, clinic right after this. Um, 
I'm not naive enough to believe that we can live in a nation without suffering. I understand that suffering is a, a part of the human condition, uh, but preventable suffering isn't. Uh, and seeing children in one of the biggest states in the country suffer because they don't have access to health insurance and because uh, of a inability to plan appropriately for this pandemic is unacceptable to me. There is one candidate that has put out a plan uh, for our nation in terms of coverage of uninsured individuals and one candidate that has put out a science-based, evidence-driven plan to deal with this pandemic. His name is Joe Biden, uh, and, uh, and he's going to win this November.